All right, James chapter number 2. James chapter number 2. Again, verse 14. What if it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and hath not works? Can faith save him? And then we went through some examples here that James gives. He warns against, and he has all through from chapter 1 on. He warns about against an inactive faith or an empty religion. He said pure religion and undefiled, and then he describes it. Now he's warning against an inactive faith, which is null and void. You know, uh, somebody said this, and I liked it. Faith is like calories. You can't see them, but you always see the results. Oh, pastor, don't you know it's on every label? I understand the black and white on on paper. I'm taught, but you can't look in there and say, oh, there's one floating around right there. You may see chocolate and caramel and a sugar-coated wafer, which constitutes a butterfinger and some other stuff. Those are good. (laughs) And you say, boy, that thing's full of calories. And you're, I concede, but you can't see one floating around. But, boy, you eat about a bunch of them, (laughs) and uh, they will catch up with you. And I've never understood a believer who says they have faith in Jesus Christ, but you can't find hiding or hair of it. It's contrary to the Word of God. Faith, like calories, will show up. (laughs) When we see Paul preach the justification by faith, he stresses the root of salvation is Jesus, faith in Christ, plus nothing, minus nothing. And James now comes along and says, hey, I, I I want you to understand you need some fruit after salvation. Yes, Uh, Salvation is by grace through faith. It is being justified through faith, but it will produce fruit. And Paul basically is saying it's like sitting in a den uh, and, and as grace, and he's looking at the fire in the fireplace, and James is on the roof looking at the smoke coming out of the chimney. Paul sees the fire. That's faith. But James is on the chimney looking at the smoke and saying, Oh, yep, there's fire. Here's the smoke. So if you say you have fire, there ought to be smoke. There ought to be evidence. There ought to be fruit um, of and from your faith. To James, the world should be able to tell that there is a faith that burns in your heart. And they should be able to see the work that comes out of our lives. Griffith Thomas is an old commentator, and I would encourage you if you find any of his commentaries, and and I would caution you on any and all commentaries, you're never going to agree with any one person on everything. The best commentators you know, I could probably tell you something that they disagree with us on, or vice versa. So be careful with all of them, but as far as commentaries are concerned, Griffith Thomas, he's an old writer, and uh, I've, I've scooped up everything he's written uh, as far as I can tell. And, and uh, he, he said this about Paul and James. He said, it is well said that Paul and James are not soldiers of different armies fighting against each other, but soldiers of the same army fighting back to back against the enemies coming from opposite directions. So James and, and Paul are not preaching different gospels. One says grace, one says works. No, no, no. They're combating, they're combating, they're back-to-back fighting. One's combating this, the other's combating that. One's combating Judaism and adding works to salvation, and the other one is combating the fact that if you have real salvation, you'll have works to accompany. You'll have a validation of your faith. So Paul and James do not contradict each other, but rather they complement each other. We are justified before God by faith, but we're justified by men, before men, by our works. 
Men can't see faith. But God can. But men can only see our works. So then our faith is validated by our works. Now, we don't do works to be saved. We do works because we are saved. I'm not a good person to my neighbor because I'm trying to get to heaven. I'm a good neighbor to my I'm a good neighbor because I'm saved and Jesus Christ is my father and I'm in the family and I don't want to give a bad name to the family. And so it's it's important for me to be a good neighbor, not because I'm trying to climb the ladder, but because I'm already going when I take my last breath, then a believer ought to be a good neighbor. A believer ought to pay their bills. A believer ought to love people. A believer ought to forgive people. That's, that's a fruit of being a believer. Paul's explaining how somebody gains entrance to salvation. James is examining how one gives evidence of it. What is the evidence? And we talked about that last week. Enough evidence to uh, convict you of being a believer. James is contrasting this head faith, this mental assent uh, of a body of facts uh, in verse 19. And we'll get there in a minute, but I want to read it to you and we'll discuss it in a moment. Verse 19, thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. So James is contrasting this head faith with this head, heart, and hand faith. And the head, heart, and hand faith works a lot better than the head faith. If all you have is a mental ascent to a body of facts and you say yes, then the Bible says you're in the same category as the demons. They believe. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But can one can somebody have genuine faith but not have works? Is that possible? No. What good is it to have a driver's license if you don't drive? Miss Tabitha is a good driver. She is. And she came over last night and, and her and my wife was practicing. And so I, my, myself and Brother Fredericks came through the door. And the first thing she wanted to tell me, Preacher, I drove on the interstate tonight. And I was so happy for her. And I am. But you know what? The moment she got her license, that interstate was available. It was available. And so, you know, just as much as, as, you know, just because you have a license and you never drive, I got my license. Well, good. Where are you driving? You know, you, no, I need, mama's going to come get me. <laughs> the license are no, to no avail. A workless faith is a worthless faith, I said last week. Empty faith is words without action, profession without performance. Now, saving faith is seen in activity. Faith is not something you only talk about. It's something that motivates your life. So if you have a real saving faith, it's just not something that you have a coffee table discussion about. If you have a real, genuine, saving faith, it's not enough for you just to have a dialogue about that faith. But it, that faith is going to be a motivating force in your life to do something about what you have on the inside. I mean, when you're sick and, and it, it manifests itself outwardly, you don't sit there, at least you should not sit there and uh, just wallow in your own physical infirmities. There, there needs to be something done about it. And so when you have a real genuine faith, when you have a saving faith, if you're looking at somebody and wondering, are they born again or not, do they have a real motivation to live out their faith? This is not a box it up, keep it for later kind of thing. You don't seal it up and put an attic never to be remembered again. Some people, they, they oh, yeah, I've been saved. Like that's, you know, that's their get out of the lake of fire card. Got a lake of fire free card, and they don't need anything. They, they, I've been saved. Well, wonderful. When's the last time you've been at church? Amen. Because those who are saved should have a desire to go. Forsake not the assembling yourselves together as a man of some is. Even the more as you see that they approach him. 
So that ought to be a desire. So, you know, wh where's the Bible? Oh, it's in the back. That, uh, well, I may have left it up there. The, I, I ain't sure. A real saving faith is going to have a motivation. You, you, don't, you know, some people in, in this younger generation, Brother Troy, I mean, good night. Some of these, some of these and I'm sorry, but I'm just going to, not the ones that are in here. These are hard workers in here. Brother Troy, some, some of these younger generation, they wouldn't work in a pie factory being a taste tester. That's a good job right there, let me tell you. <laughs> but, you know, a real saving faith, it will motivate you to do something. You don't have to light a fire in somebody's britches that gets born again and wants to do something. There ought to be, if there's real, genuine, if saving faith is in you, it will come out of you. It will not sit. It will not get stale. It will not be stagnant. It won't be silent. Saving faith will be vocal. It will be outward. It will be visible. It won't be a silent, inside your coat lapel kind of thing. It will be outward. It will be vocal. It will be visible. You'll be able to see it. You don't have to tell people, really. You ought, to, you ought to do both. I think you ought to work and you ought to witness. You ought not sacrifice one for the other. You ought to do both. Well, Pastor, I kind of believe in, comfort, I kind of believe in lifestyle evangelism, and I, I, I think you ought to just let people see uh, that Jesus is in you, and after a while they'll ask you, well, you know, what, what's going on. And, uh, well, by the time they ask you, it may be too late. I believe in both. I believe in living in front of them and then telling it in front of them. Because you may not get the opportunity to tell them. Uh, they may look at you for 20 years and die the 21st day uh, of the 21st year. And you never see them again. So you ought to do both. Real faith will work. In verses 15 and 16, we, we went over, it tells us faith goes beyond words. It reaches out to the needy, and we've done that, and I praise the Lord. We, we fulfilled James chapter 2 in these verses this week, literally. We talked about it last week. How did we know that God was going to give us an opportunity to give clothes to somebody who didn't have them? Again, it's not the, necessarily the emphasis on clothing as it is the doing of something to help. But who knew that we would be in this, in this situation? In verse 17, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Now, it, faith is not independent. It's a, it's a partnership. It's a partnership. Now, this one, this one boatman, uh, he had a little boat and he had some wooden oars, Brother King. And on one, on one oar, he had the word faith painted on. And on the other oar, he had the word works painted on. And so when they would ask, the people would ask why uh, he did that, he would, he would pull one paddle in and paddle with one paddle, and he'd paddle the boat in a circle. When they'd ask him about faith, he'd pull the works paddle in and go in a circle. They'd ask him about works, he'd pull the faith one in and go in a circle. They go together. I understand you won't have any works if you don't have faith. But if you have faith, you will have works. You will, they, they go together. And thus the boat goes the way it ought to go because faith and works are a partnership. They're together. If you don't have a use of both of these oars, you'll make no progress as a believer. And then it's not uh, independent, it's a partnership. It's not invisible, it's on display. Look at verse 18. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. It's on display. It's on display. And then verse 19. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devil also believe and tremble. Now, this one person's, this, this second person's defense here is... 
Um, you know, not, he doesn't have any, any works. They, they all hide behind his impressive knowledge uh, of the Word of God. Uh, but I want to say to you, the demons have their religious facts straight too, but they're still demons. They have intellectual knowledge, but they're still what? They're still demons. They're still demons. And that he says, hey, that they believe in the deity of Christ. When they saw Jesus, they bowed down to him and cried out that he's the Son of God in Mark 3, 11 and 12. They know his human name. What have thou to do with us? Jesus of Nazareth, Luke 4, 34. They know his origin. They know he's holy from God, according to Luke 4, 34. They recognize that he is the preaching epitomized of the gospel. Uh, he called him servants of the Most High God in Acts chapter 16. They recognize false preaching of the gospel. When it's talking about Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know, but who's this? Acts 19, 15. Demons believe in hell. They believe in hell. Uh, the demons infesting the man from the tombs, remember? The demon-possessed man, and they, they begged him not to send him into the abyss. They begged in Luke 8, 31. They begged him not to torment they believe in a set time for their punishment. Matthew 8, 29. Basically, they were saying, you know, when, when is our time? Are you come for our time? And one day they're going to run out of time. <laughs> they know Jesus is sovereign. Jesus is in control. They know they had to ask permission in Mark 5 to enter into the swine. They had to have permission. They know they must bow before Jesus. Mark 5, 6. And they submit to his word, to the power of his word. When he cast them out of the person in Matthew 17, 18. And, uh, you know, that's a, that's, that's a pretty hefty theological repertoire right there. If you put that beside somebody's name and said that we believe all this stuff, you'd say, you, you got, a, you got a, a date open, you can come speak to us. I mean, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of... A lot of professors in seminaries that don't believe what they believe. A whole lot of them. What the demons believe about God is true, 100% biblical. They know there's one God. They know there's only one in that. They, they know that there's only one. They're not atheists. They're not skeptics. They're not agnostics. Did you know there are no liberal demons who doubt the truth? we got some liberal folks today, in our, even in our Baptist churches. But you, you won't use the term a liberal demon because they believe, they believe the truth. No, no atheists. They don't, doubt, they don't doubt the truth. And he said, look, in verse 19, you, you do well. Thou doest well that you believe there's only one God, but that's only the beginning of faith. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1.1. True faith begins there, but it doesn't end there. So if you can say all those things that you believe about Jesus Christ and about God and about his power and about his abilities, then you're right in line with, with Satan and even to be afraid about it. They trembled. They were fearful. And they believed. They, they assented to a body of facts, but they would not submit themselves to the authority of Jesus Christ versus their own. So you can say you believe. You, you can say, I grew up at freedom. I've been going to freedom for 15 years, 20 years. There may be somebody in the building tonight. You've been going here a long time, but you just kind of jumped in on the coattails of somebody else and said, yeah, I believe. Yeah, I believe. But there's never been one time when you've actually put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and him alone for forgiveness of your sins. There's never been a change, and there's never been any fruit, no fruit, no root. There's no fruit in your life, I, I would very seriously wonder. I mean, if I couldn't look back and see where God had produced fruit in my life, not that I produced it, but that he produced it through me, I, I, I would be wondering about, okay, am I really born again? Was there a change? Was there saving faith? Or was it just I was sitting in class and the teacher said, do you believe? And I said, yes. 
It's important to believe. Somebody asked me one time, can you believe, can you uh, say that, or can you not believe in the virgin birth and be saved? Well, I put it to you like this. You cannot refuse to believe the virgin birth and be saved. I don't know if anybody told me about the virgin birth when I got saved. I'd never heard it. But I got saved. He just didn't cover that part. But when it was shown to me, I didn't refuse it. I believed it. I believed it. And so, you know, it's one thing to say, yeah, I believe. I've been going there since I was five. Okay, well, let's talk about what God's done with your life since five. I'm not trying to make you doubt, but I'm going to tell you, our churches are full of people that believe a body of facts. A doc, I mean, they believe a doctrinal treatise that would blow your mind. I mean, it would go beside some of the professors at Dallas Theological Seminary, but they've never bowed their knee in, in repentance and trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. You know all there is to know about everything. You know the doctrine of God. You know the doctrine of angels, the doctrine of demons, the doctrine of Last things, you can know all about the ten toes and what to represent. But unless you know Jesus Christ and forgiveness of sin, not just about him, know it, a relationship, a saving faith, it will, it will change you. So uh, there was a preacher one time that kind of did an interview. He made out like he was doing an interview with the devil. And he asked him, do you believe the Bible? Yes, I do. It's all true. Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? Without a doubt. Do you believe the virgin birth? Yes, I was there watching everything in Bethlehem. Do you believe Jesus died on the cross? Yes, I saw it happen. Do you believe Jesus rose from the dead? Absolutely, no question about it. Do you believe Jesus is coming again? Of course, he said he would. Will you be faithful in attending church? I'll be there every time the doors are open. You know, Satan's a lot more faithful to church than a lot of Baptists. I know he can't be in every place at the same time. But I'll guarantee you he sent his demons to every church service we've ever had. Without fail. And if he hadn't, I'd want to know why. I want to know what we're not doing that made him rest. Amen. Why do you think he didn't have to be here? It hurt my feelings if they weren't here. Amen. Now, I'm not spooking you. I don't want them here. But I understand if you're doing something for God, they are the opposite. They don't want, so unless we're just on easy street and coasting, not doing anything for the Lord, they will be here. They'll be here. So, yeah, he said, I'll be there every time, every time the doors are open. You know, hell will be filled with good theologians. Finally, the pastor says, you've been going to and fro throughout the world, wreaking havoc, causing pain, sowing discord, breaking up marriages, stirring up death and destruction, and dragging people down into hell. Do you hear now repent of your sin? Will you turn from your sin, bow your knee, and trust Christ is Savior, to which the devil replies, oh, oh, I don't know about that. That's something different altogether. And so says every person that rejects Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you tonight, if you're here and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, just because you don't disagree with anything I've ever said does not mean you're saved. Like if you agree with every biblical position, if you could sign our doctrinal statement at Freedom Baptist Church, that's still not going to save you. You could be lost and still sign it. Are you sure, 100% sure, you're saved? He said, they believe and tremble. Verse 20, but wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? 
Seeing that thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. I wonder tonight, do you know for sure you're saved? And do you have proof of it? Rahab, Abraham was saved by faith, but he proved it by obeying God and offered his son. He was saved by faith already before he ever went to the mountain. But he proved it how? When he took Isaac up the mountain. He proved it. What are you doing right now that proves you're born again? Rahab. She was saved by trusting God, but she showed the reality of her faith by protecting the spies and lending a hand to the Israelite army. And he said here in verse 26, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. You know, it's true physically when the soul separates from the body. Spiritually, when faith is separated from works, it ceases to exist. It ceases. Without works, faith is nothing but a corpse. Void of vitality and useless to everybody but the undertaker. But when you have faith, you will have works accompany it. What results do you see in your life right now? Genuine faith is involved. Is your faith involved? Is it involved? Genuine faith is a partnership with works. Is that your faith? Can we look at your life and say, hey, they have a working faith. They have an active faith, an authentic faith, a real faith, an expressive faith, a demonstrative faith, a friendly faith. You know faith ought to be friendly. If you have faith in Jesus Christ, you ought to want other people to have the same thing. Faith ought to be friendly. Can I just coach this a little bit tonight? When we come to church, we ought not just sit. As Brother Fletcher, we ought not just sit and wait for somebody to move us and stir us. Faith is active. You know, I know there's only one preacher here tonight. It happens to be me. But there's more than one Christian here. And every one of us as believers have a responsibility to have an active faith. What are we doing with our faith? What have you done in the last 36 hours to prove your faith? The fruits of the tree proclaim the obvious goodness of the tree. When you see that, you know it's healthy. What do you have? What are you producing? That a believer should produce. And then I ask, what are, you, what are you not producing? Faith without works is dead. Doesn't just say it's on vacation or it's coasting. You know, we like to think we can just kind of get in the middle of the road and we'll be okay. Well, if you really have saving faith, you don't want to be in the middle of the road. If you have saving faith, you want to be on the active side. The getting involved side. Father, we thank you.